Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from The Voice of America. I'm Pete Musto. And I'm Dorothy Gundy. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear stories from Adam Brock, Anna Mateo, and Jerry Watson. Later, Ashley Thompson and Katie Weaver have a special report on one of America's national treasures. But first, this report. If you are interested in studying at an American university, you have probably heard about the test of English as a foreign language. The test is widely known as the TOEFL. It is the most widely used language assessment exam for American universities. Many foreign students are frightened of the TOEFL because it is risky. Good test results on the TOEFL will open many doors. But a low TOEFL score will limit your choices for financial aid and admission to top schools. The most competitive universities generally expect an internet-based test score of 90 or above. Others accept lower scores, and some do not require a TOEFL score at all. Most universities do not publicize an actual cutoff score, but a high score will always help. There are two major versions of the TOEFL test. The first is the IBT, or Internet-Based Test. It is offered in most of the world and accepted by nearly every university and scholarship program in the United States. The other version of the test is called the paper-based test, or PBT. It is still used in some developing countries. Scholarship programs provide money for a student to continue his or her education. Many scholarship programs will accept the PBT results when a student first asks for financial aid. However, they may require students to take the IBT before official admission. The PBT is less costly to take and does not require use of the Internet. Some businesses and government offices use the PBT to test the English language skills of their employees. The IBT and PBT have very different structures. The main difference is that the IBT is completely online and includes questions to measure the person's ability to speak in English. The IBT also has integrated tasks. For example, listening, reading, and speaking are mixed together. The paper-based test does not mix the different sections. The PBT has an area to test grammar, the rules governing the use of words and phrases. The internet-based test does not. If you have a choice, take the IBT if it's not too pricey. The paper-based test is being phased out. It will eventually disappear. Here are some tips for getting started with TOEFL. Number one, plan ahead. It takes a long time to improve your TOEFL score. Many students study just before the test. Raising your score will take months of intensive work. Do not expect a big lift in your test results after two weeks. 
There is no easy way to improve your score quickly. You will have to spend a lot of time and energy. Number two, master the basics first. Many students study for the TOEFL before they are ready. You should have at least an upper intermediate English level before you attempt the test. If you score below 500 on the PBT or 70 on the IBT, study the fundamentals for a few months and come back to the TOEFL later. Number three, get a study guide. It is easy to find study guides for the IBT. Pearson, Barron's, ETS, and Kaplan all produce quality materials. Take a practice test once or twice a month. The best study guides will have explanations in the answer key. PBT study guides are difficult to find because the test is being phased out. Number four, use outside resources. Using TOEFL practice materials all the time will make you crazy. Remember, you are learning a language, not a test. You can improve your TOEFL score by making English part of your daily life. Some simple ways are listening to podcasts, informal conversation with English speakers, watching movies and reading newspapers. Some others are reading English textbooks, sending and reading text messages in English, and writing online comments in English. The bottom line is, the best way to do well on the TOEFL is to know English well. Do not depend on informal advice or tricks. Do not try to outwit the test maker. Think of reading, listening, speaking, writing, and grammar as a single connected concept, communication. The real goal of the test is to measure how well a student can communicate in an English-speaking classroom. Immerse yourself in English on a daily basis, and improvement is sure to follow. I'm Adam Brock. Welcome back to Words and Their Stories from VOA Learning English. Each week, we explore the roots and meaning of common American expressions. Today, let's talk about apples. The saying, as American as apple pie, describes things that represent the best of American culture. People use this expression when talking about things like blue jeans, baseball, and rock and roll music. But why use apple pie? Why not some other fruit, like a cherry or peach? The reason might be a man known as Johnny Appleseed. A lot of stories and even a few poems have been written about Johnny Appleseed over the years. They made him into a larger-than-life folk hero. Yet Johnny Appleseed was a real person. It was the name given to a man named John Chapman. Many Americans consider him responsible for popularizing apples in the United States. John Chapman was born in Massachusetts in 1774 during the Revolutionary War against Britain. His father reportedly fought at the Battle of Bunker Hill and later served under General George Washington. While John's mother died in childbirth, his father made it home from battle. He taught his son everything he knew about farming. The young Chapman took his father's lessons to heart. For 40 years, Johnny Appleseed is said to have cleared land and planted apple seeds in the Midwestern states of the U.S. In a short time, the seeds grew to become trees that produced fruit. 
Apples were an important food for the early American settlers. Apples offered something different in daily meals. They were easy to grow and store for use throughout the year. Perhaps the story of Johnny Appleseed has made apples and apple pie so very American. Historians can debate that, but this we do know. Apples are at the core, get it, core is the center of the apple, of many common sayings. Many apples fall from trees when they are fully grown. When we say that an apple didn't fall far from the tree, we are describing children who are very much like their mother or father. And this can be for both good and bad reasons. As we said, John Chapman's father was a farmer. So we could say that Johnny Appleseed's apple really didn't fall far from the tree. That takes this expression to a whole new level. Naturally, apple growers need a way to transport their produce to market. This is where a vehicle called an apple cart enters the story. It must have been a big mistake years ago to upset or overturn someone's apple cart. In American English, you have upset the apple cart if you ruin someone's plans or go against the usual way of doing things. In fact, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines an apple cart as a plan, system, or situation that may be disrupted or ended. But the verb used with the apple cart expression is usually upset. The first recorded use of apple cart being used in this way appeared in 1788. A man named Jeremy Belknap wrote in the History of New Hampshire that Adams had almost overset the apple cart by intruding an amendment of his own fabrication on the morning of the day of ratification. This is yet another example of how apples seem very American. The only bad thing about an upset cart of potatoes, for example, is that potatoes are all over the ground. So the word apple appears in many American expressions. But does that mean we should eat one every day? You would think so if you hear the saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. That is not scientifically proven, but eating an apple a day can't be bad for you, and someone who does good things can be described as a good apple. But there are also bad apples. And we all know that one bad apple spoils the bunch. Let's say there is a classroom of very well-behaved children. All the students are respectful. They do not shout or speak out of turn while the teacher is talking. Then a new student arrives. This student talks loudly and shows disrespect to the teacher. Soon other students follow her lead and disrupt class. In this example, you could say that one bad apple spoiled the whole bunch. Now, students who misbehave in class are not necessarily bad people. But if the student we just talked about also steals apples from the store and then throws them at very old women, you could say she is rotten to the core. Even a bad child can be loved by their parents. The father of this girl might say, My daughter would never do such things. She is the apple of my eye. But this student is not the apple of the teacher's eye. The teacher punishes her, and the class returns to the way it was. The other parents are very happy about this. They might even say, How about them apples? Or, How do you like them apples? This expression is the same as saying, well, what do you think about that? It can also be a way of showing you like or admire something. I know, I know, the grammar in the expression, how about them apples, is not exactly right, but that is how we say it. 
Americans even shorten the word about to simply bout. You won't hear anyone say, how about those apples? If a good friend tells you that their original cake recipe just won first place at a baking competition, how about them apples would be a great response to that news. However, if a friend from New York City tells you that they just won a high-profile writing award, you might want to say something else. But comparing language used in a small farming town with the language used in a city like New York is like comparing apples and oranges. There is no point because they are both so different. I'm Ana Mateo. You have written your research paper, your personal essay, your book review, whatever your college class requires. You have provided good information in the needed number of words. You feel good because your work is finished. But is it really done? Many teachers and professional writers believe that writing is revision. In other words, writing well means making needed changes and rewriting. Michael Arnzen teaches English and heads humanities studies at Seton Hill University in Pennsylvania. Mr. Arnzen is also an award-winning author. He says he understands the desire to write something and be done with it, but he believes revision of writing is a necessary skill for college. He says the classroom is a good place to practice patience, concentration, and listening. Mr. Arnzen says you should put away your paper after you have written a first version or draft. Wait several hours, maybe overnight, before working on it more. He compares this to returning to a job after a vacation. Not only are you refreshed, but you're looking at things through different eyes. That's what revision really literally means, to see again. So, you know, putting something in the drawer for a day or, you know, sleeping on it for a night, uh, that, that always seems to help. Mr. Arnzen's students follow a four-step process with their papers. Students read and listen to each other's work, share thoughts, and make suggestions. The first step in the process is invention. It includes forming many questions about their subject. The professor calls it question storming. In a second step, students draft and compose a paper. Then comes the revision period. At that time, Professor Arnzen says students take another look at what they have done. He calls the fourth step publication. He does not mean this to be professional publication. Mr. Arnzen says the process takes away some of the tension of writing. He says worry about the quality of your writing often disappears when you share that writing. He says the goal of writing a college paper is not to perform for a teacher or to produce a perfect piece. He says perfect writing is not possible. He says what is most important is getting your thoughts and ideas on paper. I'm Jerry Watson. Today, we are visiting a vast and remote park in the state of Alaska. The park is bigger than the country of Switzerland. It is six times the size of Yellowstone. In fact, it is the largest national park 
in America. Its name is Wrangell St. Elias. Do not worry if you have not heard of America's biggest national park. Most Americans do not know its name. But Wrangell St. Elias contains some of North America's largest glaciers and volcanoes. It is also home to nine of the highest mountains in America. The park extends more than 5.3 million hectares. Four mountain ranges come together here, including the Wrangell Mountains and the St. Elias Mountains. The Wrangell Mountains cover much of the park. They were formed over the last five million years from volcanic activity. The St. Elias Mountains stretch into Canada's Yukon Territory. The Chugach Mountains cover the southern part of the park. The Alaskan Mountain Range forms some of the huge park's northern boundary. The mountain landscape is wild. Much of it is also difficult to reach. Private companies offer flight-seeing tours on planes and helicopters. From high above, visitors witness Wrangell St. Elias's beauty. Rivers and glaciers help tell the story of Wrangell St. Elias National Park. These rivers, with names like Copper, Chitina, Chisana, and Chittistone, come from the park's many glaciers. They wind through land carved out by other huge glaciers long ago. The Copper, the largest river of them all, flows into the Gulf of Alaska. Other rivers take a more dramatic path. The Chittistone River becomes Chittistone Falls, a 91-meter tall waterfall that drops over a steep wall. Glaciers cover almost 13,000 square kilometers of the park. In the summer months, the park's rivers carry their meltwater. It is filled with tiny pieces of sand, stone, and other materials. A buildup of this sediment forces the rivers to flow through new channels. This causes the river beds to twist and turn. From up above, these rivers can look like braided hair. One of the park's most striking places is the Hubbard Glacier. It is the longest tidewater glacier in North America. A tidewater glacier is one that begins in a mountain valley and flows all the way to a body of water. The Hubbard Glacier is 120 kilometers long and nearly 10 kilometers wide. It begins on the 6,000-meter-tall Mount Logan in Canada's Yukon Territory. It ends in the waters of a place called Disenchantment Bay. Hubbard was named in 1890 after Gardner Hubbard, the first president of the National Geographic Society. The massive glacier is only getting bigger. Unlike most glaciers, Hubbard is thickening and extending. Other glaciers face melting caused by increasing temperatures. But experts say Hubbard reacts in an opposite way to climate change. As the Earth's temperature rises, the area around Wrangell St. Elias gets more snow and rain. Scientists say this snow and rain is what permits the glacier to grow. Sometimes very fast growth causes huge pieces of ice to break apart from the glacier. Scientists call this calving. The ice creates a thunderous sound as it breaks and falls into the water. 
Hubbard Glacier's size, beauty, and calving activity have made it popular with park visitors. Large boats travel through Disenchantment Bay, taking passengers close to the glacier. Wrangell St. Elias's system of glaciers and rivers help support animal life in the park. The park's doll sheep may be the most famous animal residents. Alaska's doll sheep are the world's northernmost wild sheep population. About 13,000 doll sheep live within the park's borders. Visitors can look for their white bodies and huge brown horns near rocky mountainsides. Visitors might also see black bears, brown bears, moose, and caribou. Caribou are large North American reindeer with huge, wide antlers. Along the coast, seals and sea lions lie on the ice and splash in the water. Wrangell St. Elias became a national park in 1980. The park's main visitor's center is about 300 kilometers east of Anchorage. The long drive to get to the park is an adventure itself. The trip includes roadside views of mountains, glaciers, waterfalls, and lakes. Its distant location makes it one of America's least visited national parks. About 75,000 people visit Wrangell St. Elias each year. By comparison, parks like Yosemite and Yellowstone get about 3 million visitors each year. Visitors can experience the park's pristine nature as well as its historical areas. The Athabascan people lived in the area thousands of years ago. The park includes sites of their villages and hunting areas. The park also has many historical structures and buildings. The National Park Service says the structures represent periods of exploration, mining, and transportation. One historical place is called Kennecott Milltown. The picturesque town tells a story of westward expansion and discovery. Miners processed nearly $200 million worth of copper at Kennecott Mines between 1911 and 1938. Many of the buildings that remain in the town have been empty for 60 years. Some are in disrepair. The National Park Service works with the local community to restore and preserve them. Some visitors stay at Kennecott during their trip to Wrangell St. Elias. The family-owned Kennecott Glacier Lodge provides beautiful views of the surrounding glacial mountains. It also gives visitors a chance to try exciting outdoor activities like glacier hiking or ice climbing. Some visitors choose to sleep in the wild outdoors. Private campsites are located in many areas of the park. Some visitors set out on long hikes in the park's backcountry area. Whatever way you visit, the immense and untouched beauty of Wrangell St. Elias National Park is guaranteed to awe. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Ashley Thompson. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Pete Musto. And I'm Dorothy Gundy.